first half of the talk will be mostly about uh, how we approach data analysis and scientific computing, um, and then talk about, well, there's a problem in uh, basically data formats and that uh, too many custom formats. How can we solve that? Then I'm going to lead into talking about, well, how does SQL relate to parallel computing? And then um, why do we just stop at using SQL for analysis? That's a little bit of a lie, but I'll get into parallel computing, functional computing, and where to go from here. Um, so I, this is what I'm interested in, is basically a trifecta of, I see a relationship between the relational data model, the functional, and the parallel, um, because of what we do at and DOE and supercomputing. Um, and to ruin the punchline, it's not Spark. Whatever it is doesn't exist yet. But there are pieces in Spark and, and exist here and there. Oh, by the way, um, just for people that didn't notice, I do have the GitHub with the slides and all my content and code that you can uh, download and get. And there's a virtual machine that you can get too. So let's get going. So just a little bit of background, what, where I come from, the things that I do. So I work with a lot of computational scientists. They're doing numerical models and computer simulations and processing real-world uh, real data um, from uh, instruments like telescopes and particle physics. Um, these two pictures are actually codes that I have worked on. Where I don't write simulations, but I help scientists analyze them. This is MPAS Ocean. It's an ocean climate model. And the other one is um, dark matter cosmology. It's called HACC, H-A-C-C. Uh, H -A -C -C. Um, but I work with a lot of uh, scientists, and they're running really big simulations. So we have supercomputers in the Department of Energy. I'm just just give a list of different ones that we, uh, their existence, we call these sort of like the leadership class uh, uh, computers, sort of like, um, I don't know, bragging rights uh, are big computers. And so large scale simulations mean large scale data. So like with MPAS Ocean, um, can generate terabytes for one, say, climatology run. With HACK, same way, you can get up to petabytes when they're doing, trying to do a simulated universe. And then when we're talking about parameter sweeps, like running these simulations multiple of times with multiple input configurations, we'll multiply all these numbers by x. Um, so, and what this leads to is just custom data formats. And it's really annoying because uh, there's various reasons why this happens. Like uh, they wrote the code before HDF5 or NetCDF. They're small teams. They have, don't have expertise in I.O. And the other thing is like they actually spend time writing their own custom I.O. because speed is the slowest thing in, um, or I.O. is the slowest thing in supercomputing. So it makes a pain to do any sort of analysis because of having no common format. So in, in the DOE, the Department of Energy, we have two open source scientific visualization tools. You probably have never heard of them. They may be interesting to you, but you can download them here. The links are in the slides, Paraview and Visit. Um, and just in Paraview alone, I counted 150 readers. So I, I opened up the, the open file dialog and scrolled through there, and there's 150 of them. That's just crazy. And that's not counting like VTK, it's got like 250. It's basically, yes, adapter to a particular format to read the data into the VTK memory model because VTK has its own memory model. Um, I won't go into it, but, but it has its own memory model. But it's basically how do you deserialize all of this data from disk and get it into the format that Paraview or Visit or VTK wants to process it. So just a typical analysis workflow goes something like this. I encounter a new scientific team. I get some data from them. And either I got to create a new reader for their data or um, translate their data into a common format. Or I get lucky and they actually have one that Paraview supports. But that's usually unlikely. Um, and then get to the task of visualizing and analyzing their data. And, and these two points, this either thing, this is what I'm going to try and teach you is like write your own reader um, reader, 
um, that's portable in lots of different tools so I don't have to do it for you and then you can kind of analyze and visualize your data on your own without having to come say to me. So in the following we're going to analyze a simple heat transfer simulation that I've written um, and sh just show some analysis workflow. So um, th these when I say to follow along I'm not actually expecting you to follow along. This is for later when you have the the content and want to look at it but I'm just going to open up my version of it here. And so I have this data from this for Fortran heat simulation. It's a simple tab separated values format. It's separated into files, one per time, one per processor. Actually, this is a, a multiprocessor simulation. So I ran it with four cores. And um, this is pretty common, right? It's like end up writing just whatever, whatever the scientist decided was good at the time. And so over here in my in my Python, uh, this is just with Jupyter, I created some routine to read this file. Don't worry about the code, this is just sort of like an example. And then I have to go through some more routines just to verify that my reader is working and and doing some plotting of the data. And like I have to do this crazy stuff to handle like what they did with processor or what I did with processor and time to basically be able to read the data correctly. And for instance, right, if I just read one portion of it, what one processor output, I don't get the entire thing. So I have to handle these, these cases to be able to read all of the processors for one time step and then... Um, then I'm okay. So now, now I have my heat transfer. I can read it in. I can start processing it. Just to give you a little bit of idea, what's going on here is like we've got like a little 2D plate, and I initialized it with some hot points, and it dissipates over time. We'll talk about it a little bit later, but you don't have to worry about it too much now. But I'm able to read it in. So, but that was simple relatively simple. What if I want to do a query on the data? In particular, do a plot of maximum temperature over time. So now I got to read every single time step, write some code for that, collect the maximum, sort the data by time, and then plot. That may not seem, seem hard, but that it gets really tedious when you're writing all of this stuff all the time. So um, this is potentially a lot of custom Python code for one tool for 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 one uh, code. So how can we get around this? So you may be immediately saying, well, why don't you use data frames? Why, why don't you use pandas? Or why don't you use R? Um, why don't you load it in a Spark? We'll talk about Spark later, but for now, let's skip that. Um, but we are going to do, oh, did you have, OK, sorry. Well, well that, that's actually the end of my talk is that I'll already ruin it for you, is that supercomputers don't run Java in the cloud stack. We're very customized. So, but... But, like, do you get data in different databases, like NoSQL databases? Nope. No, no, no. We, no. So no scientists, hardly any scientists in my field use databases. So that, that's just the matter of fact. It's almost all binary blobs in custom formats. But we can talk later, so... Any rate, um, so uh, so we are going to do that. Um, we are going to represent it as a data frame, and but we're going to do it directly without copying with streaming. It'll be reasonable. It's not a data frame, but it's a table. So in comes the relational data model. So um, SQLite one reader to rule them all. So the, I'm basically going to show you how to visualize the same data as a table. And uh, we're going to use a SQLite virtual table on the, the Fortran data set. So we'll be able to do SQL queries on it. Um, no ingest. The data will sit at rest. And it has the same function as data frames. So you're not really... Um, I have a whole sort of um, um, opinion on why I don't like data frames. And you can read my Python notebook. And uh, I don't like them. Um, but... Uh, once you create this virtual table, it will be readable in anything that understands SQLite, assuming that uh, extension loading's on. But you can also compile your own version of SQLite and um, have your virtual table compiled into it and then loaded into your tool. At any rate, 
So let's go back to our notebook and scroll down a little bit here. And you can see my, my hatred of uh, data frames there. And so um, in the case of Python here, I've already created the, the virtual table. So just uh, um, it's already been created. We'll look at the code later. But it's that DB load extension thing. So you load it. Um, and then this very next bit here is you say create virtual table Fortran using heat. You give it some parameters. Those parameters are whatever you want um, to have. So you can parameterize your virtual table however you want. And now we have a cursor. Or we have a table in Python. And so we can do simple things like, well, give me the schema of this table. Um, uh, select a min. Give me the max. And it's all very easy now. Easy, in my opinion. And now we can do things like plotting. So we go back to our plot example and doing the same exact thing as before, except now we're going through SQLite. And what the, now you can do really cool sorts of queries on your data. For instance, I wrote this little bit of code here to be able to just sort of arbitrary plot any query. So select time max heat from Fortran group by time. So that's basically saying, uh, give me, give me um, a, a plot of time versus temperature. And so we plot it out. They can do other interesting things like combine two of them together. Yep. Can you better understand what you mean by no ingest? So no ingest. We're not actually copying it into a SQLite database. What we're doing is interpreting it as a database. We're giving SQLite provides an API that you write some functions. Uh, we'll go through that of what you have to implement. And it allows you to interpret whatever data that you want as a relational table. So is it reading like your CSV? Mm-hmm. Direct from CSV as Yep. Well. And so there's actually existing virtual tables that comes with SQLite. They've implemented crazy enough JSON. They've implemented CSV. My format is close enough to CSV that I could have probably used their CSV writer, but I created my own. So go ahead. So, so we'll talk about indexing, and, and um, there's a trick there. And so yes, you can index. And that's actually, I have indexed by time in here. And so if I do a query by time, it's actually super fast. and knows exactly which file is that time step. So at any rate, yeah. So we can do interesting things and do crazy stuff like joins now. And this is just a plot of some join that I did and then some difference. So you can take a look at it later. Um, I have a lot of content. Um, so there's a lot. Everything that I've written is completely annotated. I wrote it in sort of a literate style. So you should be able to look at the code, see all my comments, my thought processes of how I, how I wrote the code. So notebook with SQLite, we did some inspection. We did some, some image queries. We did some time queries. We did a complex query. and then. The reason I put this up here is like a lot of people don't realize that the types of things that you can do in SQL are basically the traversable pattern. Because um, if you deconstruct a SQL query, the select statement is basically your map and reduce functions. Um, the, the where is your filter. These two are your key functions. We'll talk about join later. We won't get into jo join quite yet. And you can think about a table as a traversable of tuples. And this is sort of like the connect connection I'm trying to make with functional programming is that there isn't really that much of a paradigm difference between how you think about SQL and how you think about, say, querying a list of tuples or operating on a list of tuples. And Uh, tuples, I mean by um, uh, uh, a column of uh, stuff, like a five tuple would be like, uh, yeah, it's a row. So that's the other way to think about it is like a tuple is a row, a list is a table. I'm, I'm just trying to draw out these analogies. Um, the other sort of thing about uh, SQL and SQLite is like you actually get lazy evaluation and you get immutability as well.
because uh, with views, uh, you can build up these complex queries and they won't be executed until you absolutely need them. And um, you get immutability as well because everything, assuming you don't do in place mutation. So if you don't do insert, update, and delete, then you're, then you're sort of golden. And then you can think about this as, as um, sort of immutable data. And with the SQLite, you could actually implement it such that you don't have to implement any writing functions into your format. So you can treat your data as read-only, and then you don't really have to worry about SQLite screwing up your data and just treat it as a read-only source. So we're going to talk about actually uh, making the connection here of making it look really functional. So dplyr is this great thing. So dplyr was created by Hadley Wickham in, um, in the R community. Um, he's a great guy. He does tons of tools. And one of the things that he created was this basically traversable transformer model for SQLite databases. And so you can more or less do these things like um, Haskell up there is my version of the Haskell um, simulation. I loaded it up here where I said um, given uh, I'm creating a virtual table Haskell using the files in the Haskell database and, or in the thing. That's actually creating, um, I do have to do a little bit of stuff in the beginning. And then after that point, you can think about Haskell itself as sort of like a list. And so now we can do things like filter. Select. Select is kind of like map where you're dropping a column. Mutate is, um, is basically map but adding in a column. And you can actually see what this code gets transformed into into the SQLite code. But it gives you a really convenient way to now program in SQL without having to learn SQL. This is just more code to show you what SQLite's doing. And so we can do interesting things like repeat the same plot that I did before. Let me just show you the um, a little bit of code. It might be a bit too much. Let me find a good complex. Well, we'll talk about the histogram one here. So. The histogram one here is like, I'm going to create a manual histogram. I have the simulation and thrust. I want to find where all the heat values are greater than zero. And then I'm going to summarize them um, by basically scaling them by log 10, doing some other normalization of the data, and then we compute it. Same way, uh, just some more. Uh, mutation or transformation of our data and then we chain it all together into these big sort of tra data transformers and the really cool thing about this is like um, dplyr just automatically integrates with ggplot which is called the ga grammar of graphics so this funny little widget thing the thing that looks like um, the percent uh, greater than percent that's the pipe operator in deep in r and so it's piping all this stuff through. And then it just automatically pipes into ggplot. So it's basically, you think about this huge chain of transformers now. And it makes really cool programs because now, now you're, um, instead, of, instead of sort of like all of this trouble of loading in my data and then having to do all this imperative code to select everything and stuff like that. You can build up these queries just by using transformers. It's like, oh, I didn't quite get what I wanted. Let me filter out that data. Or, oh, that's interesting. Let me map it and transform it somehow. And so now you can think about doing all of these transformations on your data through SQLite and it just automatically pipes directly into ggplot and it looks like read in data, transform, 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 graphics transform, plot. And it's, it's super cool. And the other nice thing about this is with um, dplyr, it's seamlessly integrated with Sparkler. And so you can actually do the same code that you write in, on your SQL that works with Spark as well. So I'm going to show how we go about creating the SQLite virtual table. Um, so the example code that I have is in C using the native API, but 
the API is well defined, so if you're not comfortable with C, you should be able to implement it in some other language that has foreign function interfaces. For example, you can write virtual tables with this APSW, um, so you can implement everything in Python if you wish. Um, and so the API. Uh, the API is like you have to implement opening and closing a table, creating and closing a cursor, indices, query, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go through this because I'm going to draw an analogy is that what we're really creating is an iterator over a list of tuples. So the things that we have to do to basically tell SQLite about how to interpret our data as a table is we have to define what the table is, give it a schema. So we have to say it's, it's uh, these, these columns. Then we also have to do things like creating the cursor, which is the iterator state. Um, like what is the current position that SQLite is in its query over your data? So you have a couple of stateful things that you have to keep track of. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about indices, but you can think about indices as basically a way of mapping values to row positions in that SQLite will want to do something like hey, do you have an index on your time column? And if so, can I use it? Um, then basically doing a query is like um, giving the arguments to a filter function. So you're basically um, ingesting what the, the, the constraints are that you want to iterate over and storing those. Then next, this is the iterator um, portion. This is probably the most important thing that you have to implement for correctness. Extracting values from the tuple, that's where you're returning the values at a particular row and just then telling a SQLite that it's at the end of its query. So this is the structure of our data. It was some files that looked like s sort of tab separated values. And there's actually some metadata in the file name such that we, we actually care about this zero, this was our processor, and this was our time ID. And we, what we're doing is basically creating an API such that when SQLite calls our data, it can appear to be a table and allow it to start a query on your table, iterate over it, and all you're doing is returning the values at a particular row in your position in your table and you're filling out the functions to service these requests. So let me bring up the, the C SQLite code just real quick here, just to show you the things that you do have to implement. So what you have to implement is connect and disconnect. That's where you're basically telling SQLite about the schema of your data set. Open and close, that's the creation of a cursor. Best index and filter, this is a protocol that SQLite goes through when it wants to start a query on your data set because what it will ha happen is it will call best index several times when it wants to start iterating over your data and ask you, do you have an index on this column? Do you have an index on that column? And it's trying to optimize how to iterate over your data. And then after it figures out what's the best plan for your particular data set, then it will call filter, which gives your data the constraints. And then it will repeatedly call next until it reaches the end of your data set. And it will periodically call column and EOF, where EOF is the end of the query. So you're implementing an iterator over your data set. Um, Yeah, so for instance here, you have to keep some state around. In particular, we have a table and there's the base of, of the SQLite table, but there's also information that we care about, like the path to the files. And so when you're creating these things, you do have to keep some state around that SQLite will pass to you every time it's iterating over your data set. And getting to X next, this is the most important thing that you're implementing over your data set is how to iterate over it. 
you can kind of think about it as implementing the recursion step of implementing map where you think about you've got a list of stuff you're at a current position in the list what is it that you need to return to somebody that is iterating over your data set so there's some state that's passed in that's your cursor um, you're keeping track of where you are currently in your file and in the case of what I implemented I implemented parsing the file name because there is two bits of information that we're returning back to um, the SQLite. We actually parse the processor and the time step, and that's presented as column data um, to SQLite. And then every time we get to a new file, we open that file, and then we start iterating through that file too. And then we read a line from the file, parse it, and then every time SQLite says column, say processor, we return the processor value or a column heat, we return it the, the processor heat. So what you can think about what's really happening is SQLite is taking your SQL statement and transforming that into this iterative program that is traversing your data set. And it's treating your data as this iterator model where it's just calling next, 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 and you're just servicing the requests to it of like, you're at currently at this row, I'm going to give you back the values at this particular row. Do you have difficulty when you have pathologically bad JSON with arbitrary levels of nesting and trying to flatten it into like a SQL? Um, I haven't done this with JSON, and I know there's an existing SQLite JSON reader, but I haven't looked into it because obviously there JSON is unstructured and so there could be whole tons of stuff that is basically null data and so then you're filling out this huge sort of wide schema that has a whole bunch of nulls in it and so there is that sort of pathological problem of like certain unstructured data sets don't really fit within the structured data model but in our case in my scientific computing world nearly all of our data is structured um, so there's that. But I, I do understand the problem of if you have pathologically unstructured data, it's probably not going to fit well. And you probably just want to use a JSON reader anyways. So any rate. Um, so is this it? Uh, so you can see my code for the complete Im uh, annotated implementation. All, all this code's here. It's all, it's all annotated for you so you can learn. Um, like I said before, the iteration logic primary relies on x next, yada, yada, yada. And to get to your question of um, indexing, this could be the second most important thing that you implement. And it really depends on how complex you want to make it. Because what it is is that um, it's this protocol process between SQLite and your implementation, where, as I said before, it will ask you, hey, do you have an index on time? I'm looking to do equality on time. And you're more or less just responding in this protocol to say yes or no, and what's the, what's the estimated cost of using your index, and it uses that to optimize its queries over your data set. So you do not have to implement any indices at all. Um, yeah, so if you don't, implement any indices by default what SQLite will always do is just traverse your entire data set to service any query. But the more indices that you add, the faster that SQLite will always perform. And in our case, I did implement a time index. And the way that I did that, which is on the next slide, is that, so it goes through this protocol and say we, we're doing this, this uh, selection up here where select star means select all the columns out of a data set from our table where time step equals 1700. So what will happen is SQLite will call your implementation of best index and say, hey, do you have an index on time? And I want to do equality. I want to do equality on, on this, this column. Then you'll respond, yes, I have an index in our case we do and then after it figures out the optimal plan then it will then call filter which is actually the start of the iteration over your data set that's when you're actually setting up the state of your cursor 
And then it will pass in 1700 at that point. And that's the point where you store that information that SQLite is interested in filtering on time step 1700. Then in your next implementation, that's when you're actually doing the filtering. You are excluding all files that don't have 1700 in it. But the thing is, is how, how you want to implement that can be totally up to you. It doesn't have to be implemented any particular way. You could use hash maps. You could use some sort of trees. You, in, in my case, all I did was um, I recorded what operator SQLite wanted to do. Say it's less than, greater than, equality. I recorded the number, the, the range that I was interested in, say 1700. I stored that in the cursor, and then every time I got to a new file and I parsed the file name, I, I just checked to see whether or not the SQLite constraint met the file name constraint where we've got that data in the file name header. And I just skip over it and skip to the next, next file. And it actually makes it super fast um, because now you've implemented this, this index on your data set. So maybe one of the questions you might have is like, uh, can I use SQLite's indexing um, for that it uses on its own file format? No, you can't. So if you want to use have indexing on your data, you do have to implement it yourself. There's that. Um, so virtual tables, portable readers, um, streaming, no ingest, no copying, uh, not tied to a particular tool. I showed you reading it in uh, Python, reading it in R. I need to fix ParaView such that it can use SQLite virtual tables as well. But the cool thing about this now is like, now you have this implementation that's usable across many different analysis tools. Um, I haven't checked, say, if MATLAB supports it. I assume it has a SQLite reader. Um, so there are some drawbacks to this. So there's a magic, com magic compiler that's the query optimizer. And it doesn't always do the best, but I have a link to sort of how you um, give it hints on how to optimize queries. The other thing is, is SQL and SQLite is an interpreter. SQLite is running an interpreter over your data. So there's that. And if you get into really big data, say the data that I'm working with, you may be, you're just hosed. But um, the more indices that you add, the better you are. So I actually have implemented this on the dark matter cosmology data. And that's like hundreds of gigabytes. And we have indices for spatial indexing and we have indices for time. And that still allows us to do really fast queries that the scientists are interested in. But if you're doing sort of like this batch processing where you want to um, ingest all of it all at once and say, generate an average of the entire data set, probably SQLite isn't your best solution and actually want to get something like maybe Spark. So why is that? So SQLite is an interpreter and so it's not really compiled code. Um, so it's executing at interpreter speed. But if you're, if you're bandwidth limited, then it's going to be as fast as it can read through the data. So in that case, it doesn't matter. But, um, and SQLite can run with threading. Um, I haven't done many performance tests on it to see how well it scales out. Um, but yeah, if you're getting into really, really big data and you need to distribute it, you might need to look into other solutions. But that's my sort of lead into like, why should I learn relational programming? What if I do have really big data? How, how does this stuff related to parallel computing? And this is the thing is like um, the relational data model is very, oh, so let me stop um, before I go on because I'm s sort of shifting gears into the second half of my talk and talking about data parallelism and how all of this stuff relates to functional computing and data parallelism. So did anybody have any questions about SQLite? Um, all the code's there, so you, you can you can read it and see how I implemented it, and 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 go from there. Questions? Okay. Do you want to say about SQLite and it's like, like you said for for uh, data processing? If you're not doing, as you said, updates and deletes and the rest, it's rapid fast. Yeah. And 
Right. I'm blown away at the speed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm usually pleasantly surprised by its speed. I mean, the, the reason that I'm telling, extolling the virtues of SQLite to you guys is like, I think it was five years ago, it changed my workflow. It, it, was, it was sort of like an epiphany to me. It's like, oh my God, things are so much easier now. Um, because back in the day when I was doing all these, this data processing stuff, say I'm writing a supercomputing paper on some sort of performance of this simulation or some, some algorithm, I'm taking all these numbers and then I have all this custom code to say, read in those numbers and say, put them into pandas or some other thing and yada, yada, yada. And, and then once I discovered SQLite, I was like, oh my God, my life is so much simpler now. Um, so that's sort of my cell of why I think SQLite is so amazing. It, it just changed my life. And, and uh, I don't know. I, I think it's an amazing tool. So any anyway, rate, so getting back on track. Um, so SQL related.
an independent operation in every data element in the array. And so we don't have to worry about any sort of these fan in problems because we're always taking the last time step and writing to a new time step. So shared memory parallel Fortran, if we're doing it in OpenMP, we add those couple of fences around that, the, those for loops, and it will parallelize on the J, um, J uh, loop. I'm gonna skip over this um, code a little bit here. Um, let me show you this though. One, just one line to parallelize it in Haskell. You just say compute P and it divides the work up among all your parallel processes. So there's a problem with the, the Fortran code in that we have a doubly nested for loop and we have an I loop and a J loop. And the problem is, is if you express it that way, OpenMP really doesn't know how to parallelize that code. It's like, does it divide the work up this way? Does it divide the work up that way? Does it do it like this? Um, so you can, you can kind of leave it up to the runtime to try and figure out, well, what's the best way to divide up your work? Um, and it's happening the same thing in the, in the Haskell code in that when you have the, um, the traverse and then you say compute P, compute in parallel, with traverse, it's gonna decide how to divide up the work however it wants, but that becomes tricky if there's unbalanced work. So what I'm gonna argue is that, uh, and this is where Blala comes in, is that you want to flatten all of your nested parallelism into arrays. And the reason that you do this is then be it becomes very trivial to divide up the work. You're just segmenting the array by however many processes you have this is the trick behind, say, thrust, GPU programming, relational tables. If you're able to break up a table into segments and you're not doing something like a join, and Spark RDDs. And so if you, if you learn flattening, then you have a tool in your toolbox for how to write sort of performant parallel code from the very start. Um, but it does require doing things like indexing. And this is the stuff of what Thrust is made of. And at the very end, I'm gonna say, we don't wanna do it like Thrust because it's too hard. So in Thrust world, you have to explicitly build indexing arrays. And so you have to think about taking a 2D array, flattening it to a 1D array, and having all this crazy 1D indexing that's going on. And so to do the same sort of, um, same sort of a stencil that we did in the 2D code, but we flattened that 2D array to a 1D array, you have to have these lists of indexing arrays. And that can be hard. But I'm gonna talk about how we can make it easier instead, and we can reason about 1D arrays rather than using explicit indexing, but actually using something that comes from the relational paradigm, and that's called the join. So what a join is, is a Cartesian product. So given two, two arrays, you're, you're doing the Cartesian product over that, where you're taking for all x's and all y's, pairing them up, and then applying a filter. You're filtering things out. And the reason that this is good is that now we can talk about indexing in a 1D away because we can have arrays of indices and arrays of temperature values and do that in a 1D operation. So people may not know what, uh, what a join is, so I'm gonna go through it very quickly. So say we're designing some game and my artists created some monsters for me and then my level designers created some environments for, for me. So what I could do is make all combinations and combine them all together. But there may be some combinations that I really don't want in my game. This is sort of the join because you can think about, I have some monsters and they have some attributes where this, this drogger may only show up in the crypts and therefore we have this relationship between droggers and crypts and we don't want them to say show up in the Dwemer ruins or something like that. Um, so how does this relate 
to our simulation code. So this is the heat equation in Spark. So the heat equation in Spark, this is tough. I don't expect you to get it right away. But what we're doing is we're taking a topology list. That's our list of indices, how all the points in the grid relate to each other. And we're joining them on the current temperature. And this is doing a lookup operation that you would typically do in a nested for loop. So it's, it's this operation here. So say I have ID4, which is that point in that grid, and it's adjacent to all these other points. You can create a relationship on points to temperature, point to adjacency, and we can collect that all together through the join operator, which fuses all of the temperatures for a given ID and do a group by. So what's going on here? So array indexing is fundamentally a join, except you have some knowledge about the distribution of your keys, which are your indices, and the values that you're looking up on. So given some, say, indices that I care about and some values, a for loop is a join in that you have a list of indices, you're iterating over them, and you're using those to look those things, some other data up. And that's exactly what we're doing back in these examples back here, where I now lost my part spot. So that, that's this part here is like we have these indexing things going on where I and J are some indices that we care about. And we're trying to look up the temperature in some other array. And all I'm doing is trying to explicitly expose what we're doing in sort of array data lookup is that you're, you're doing a join fundamentally in that you have some data, you're doing some lookup, and you're fusing that data together into the same list. So the bonus round here is what's the really crazy one. So I implemented the heat equation in R using dplyr. And here's the funny part. It's like, here's the SQL code. So I have done this on my own separately. I don't have any example of this. But this is to try and close the loop on this entire thing is that it is possible to write a heat equation in native SQL. I've done it once before. And to try and convince you that there's a relationship between SQL, data parallelism, and, and the functional model. So to wrap up here, so concluding thoughts of why should I learn this stuff? Um, a lot of you probably aren't scientists, but just to give you a background, the typical way to do um, data programming in scientific computing is with MPI. It's called Message Passing Interface in OpenMP. Why should I learn, say, this stuff instead of that? Well, data parallelism is key to programming GPUs and multi-core processors. You, this is a skill set that you ought to have if you want to program those things, because that's the way that they're best suited to computing. It gives you a uh, portable parallelism. Once you have this tool in your, in, in your tool belt, it gives you lots of ways to think about how do you program in parallel. And data analysis in SQLite in that you're using the same sort of skills that you've learned in all across these things. Um, but MPI is messy. It requires a lot of bookkeeping. Uh, there's a performance gap. So, that heat equation runs in three seconds in Fortran. It takes 30 minutes in Spark. Uh, am I dumb? Uh, maybe. Um, so I'm sure somebody will look at my Spark code and say, well, you shouldn't have implemented it that way or this and that. I don't disagree, but frankly, it's numbers like these why Spark, say, doesn't get used in our world. Uh, we use something completely different, and the numbers are one of the reasons. Um, the other reason is uh, supercomputers don't run the Java stack. Um, secondly, and this is the reason that this talk was a research talk, is that I'm really interested in seeing the overlap between the relational, the data parallel, and functional crossover. My, my ideas aren't 100% baked, which is why I gave this talk in this venue, but 
I hope you can walk away from this and I've given you at least a tool to say, um, uh, expose your data in SQLite. Um, and uh, no offense to the APL guys, I talked to them, they're very nice people, but there's plenty of people doing array languages. So there's a need for a next gen Spark. I, there's, there's been lots of uh, papers in supercomputing on re-implementing the core logic in MPI and C++. So there's that. Um, we have a lot of knowledge in the way that we do computing and, and data um, communications on how we could actually help uh, Spark optimize join. Because we have a lot of tricks that we called ghost cells and, and different partitioning strategies um, that avoids all-to-all -all communication that might happen in the shuffle. Um, the other great thing is like, I'd like to see like a Spark that automatically compiles to a GPU like Thrust. Um, and the other thing is like, um, as far as I know, Spark only has one join and it's the Equa join. It'd be nice if there are a lot of other joins in Spark and the ability to basically plan the parallel execution based on your indices, right? So um, there's, in what we do, if you consider an array as a column in a table, we already have a natural index on that array or that, that table, and that's called the, the array index. And we have constant time lookup. And it'd be super cool if I could have a join and say, hey, by the way, Spark, this thing's an array. You don't have to sort of like do a binary search or build me an index or yada, yada, yada. You can just do an, an instant lookup on the data. And finally, I'm not actually suggesting people to write simulations in SQL. That'd be crazy uh, because all this stuff in BLAST and LINPACK. But there's ideas worth revisiting. Uh, vector parallelism is 40 years old now. A SQL is even older. And this talk was an outcome of my desire to see uh, a faster spark that combines all of these aspects. And I'm just raising the question of where we might go in parallel computing to make it better, usable, and more performant for everybody. And I'm out of time. I need to give the next speaker his thing. But if you have questions, I'll be outside and I'll take your questions if um, you, you have any. So thanks for your time.